Y'all don't move to the back. What you say? I love you. Oh. All right, there's your anesthesia machine. Now, next thing is monitoring. This is it. Am I nervous? Yeah. They don't notice Victoria. They see Victoria. If you look, the upper jawbone is in three pieces. Okay, this child has a uh, incomplete cleft of the palate. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We also love children very much. We should share this experience with uh, the people all over the world. There is no way back to old system. WTKR News presents To Russia With Love a special half-hour report on Operation Smile's historic first mission to Russia. Photographer John McNulty and reporter Bruce Barry travel with the Operation Smile medical teams to St. Petersburg and Moscow. In a moment, their report. You'll be... Mm, we shall Perhaps try. astonished <laughs> with <laughs> such ancient style <laughs> in our hospital. Maybe Whatever gets the job done. done. A group of American volunteers has come to St. Petersburg to teach the Russians the latest surgical techniques used to repair facial deformities. This is the first Operation Smile team meeting. They meet their host, Professor Genrich Kaskevich, and his daughter, Julia, who will help translate. Not, not Team leader Craig Hall's first concern is the screening process, selecting the patients for surgery in the limited time available. Pick cases that are beneficial for both of us that you want to see that we can do. So and, you mean working done. time for tomorrow? Not, not for tomorrow, for the actual OR time starting next week. How, how much time do we work from eight o'clock to what day to what time? Professor, suppose that uh, our our specialists will look for your work and uh, will listen for you all the time you would like to speak. Okay. So, and usual working time, it doesn't matter. Before screening begins the next day, the team gets a tour of St. Petersburg Regional Children's Hospital. In a hall, photographer Gary Bogdan notices a little girl with a horribly deformed mouth. When I first saw her, I thought, boy, that was my first time I'd ever seen one really in person. And it's hideous, you know, to look at a child has to be born that way. I took a couple of pictures of her, and she uh, immediately wanted to play with the camera and reached up for me and want me to hold her. If you look at the palate now, there's a couple of areas where it's excoriated without doing anything. The Americans have agreed they will select cases that'll show the Russians the latest techniques in repairing cleft lip and palate, surgical methods developed during the Cold War era when Soviet bloc countries were isolated from the West. But they will screen all the children who've come to the hospital, almost a hundred of them. They will assign each case a priority number. They only want us to do 30 cases, okay? So I'm giving one to the cases that we're definitely going to do, two to cases that we could do, and three to ones that we won't do. With that decision made, each child is then sent through a series of examinations, dental, ear, nose and throat, the anesthesia team, and pediatrician Norm Scott. Let's see how strong you are. The main thing we need to look for is that they don't have any heart disease, or a lung disease that's going to make the child a risk at surgery. Ha! Huh. Yes. Yeah. Oh, lipstick. Recovery room nurse Melinda Sachs has discovered the little four-year-old. She's learned the child is an orphan, a ward of the hospital. She's been here since she was about a year old. She was left here by her parents. Most Obvious, likely, obviously, because of this, the cleft palate. And so we were saying, oh, well, this must be one of the little children that we're going to do. And um, when we asked, and they said, no, she wasn't. And we were like, ooh. She's just such an adorable little girl. She uh, has a great personality and just loves to be held. Yeah. 
In the United States, we do cleft palate operation in nine months of age on this type of patient. To give them so for speech, that, that works good for us. Dr. Barry Boyd of Orlando, Florida, begins one of the first cases with Dr. Kaskevich assisting. With the help of interpreters, they talk about each step of the surgery. Both will learn from this. The Americans have given Kaskevich a nickname that's easier to pronounce. Dr. K, can you hold a nasal flap this way? Mm -hmm. Day one of surgery is underway. First case is done and on its way to recovery. Victor, 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 you okay? It is the case anesthesiologist who brings the child from surgery to the recovery room. Dr. Bob Taints briefs the nurses. So he's still a little bit narcotized, you know, his pupils are still, mm -hmm. which is fine. And if you need him to cough, just give him a jaw lift and he'll, oh, sorry, Victor, like that. Thank you, okay. And that is it. Thank you. Our first case is complete. We have a Propex, so we have non-invasive blood pressure, EKG. We have everything once we get hooked up. Cool, we're set, we're going in. Another Operation Smile team is preparing to begin surgery at Moscow's Facial Pediatric Center. The children selected for surgery are generally older than those in St. Petersburg, and the Moscow mission is a little different. These will be more difficult revisions of repairs done when the children were younger. They're not sure exactly what to do with the nasal deformity or the, what we call the secondary lip deformity. In other words, it's already had its primary repair and now what do you do with it? And we see similar cases like this at home. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, different techniques for repairing cleft lips. Some look great when they're done, but five, ten years later don't look as good. And so these are difficult problems in the U.S. also. Sort of work a little narcotic and try to cut down on the amount of waste gas right. that we have through here. As the team completes the OR setup, plastic surgeon Tom Bame scrubs. It's his first Operation Smile mission, and he admits to some nerves. It's like three concert jitters or something like that. You're just a little worried. You hope everything goes well. My uh, professor taught me never throw anything away. <laughs> But in a secondary lip, it's, there's ex, sometimes extra tissue, so... This is scar tissue. As surgery begins, Russians and Americans are paired, the better to compare notes. And to break the ice, Tom Bame shows he's learned some Russian. How far is the boot? Gennady. Tom. Gennady. Gennady. Gennady, yes. And you are Tom? I'm Tom, yeah. Tom. Watching over each surgery with interest is Dr. Larissa Frolova, who has been developing this center for 30 years. She thinks of the children as her own and does not hesitate to make suggestions to the Americans. Uh, she uh, uh, she thinks maybe it's a cut here through the vermilion. And I rotate it around. Yes. I thought about that. That's not a bad idea. How about we do this? We cut this way, this way, and down, uh -huh. and try to rotate. Uh -huh. hey. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Tell a great mind, same gutter. <laughs> uh, Dr. Frolova is, uh, reminds me of a ballet grand dame. She has an incredible presence and obviously controls uh, her hospital uh, with a real force and uh, really loves the kids. Yeah, okay, uh, scissors one more time. We'll just Dr. K, excellent. Surgery continues in St. Petersburg. Children's lives are being changed. But the American team is concerned over one who may be left out. Her name is Victoria, a little four-year-old with a grotesque deformity she seems not to notice. Do you see somebody who at first physically is not pleasing? Mm -hmm. And then you get to know them, and all of a sudden they're pleasing, and then they're pretty, and then they're just beautiful. And I think that that's what happened to Victoria. She, at first, was so displeasing that she may have been abandoned. We don't know why she's orphaned.
Russia's first great czar, Peter, began building his city in 1702 at the eastern shore of the Gulf of Finland. Russia needed a fortress against the Swedes, but what Peter the Great had in mind was a classic European city. And when Catherine the Great reigned, the city expanded. And the arts flourished. The era thus begun gave the world Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff, Pushkin and Pasternak, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy. Petrograd, Leningrad, and now again St. Petersburg has survived the armies of the Swedes, Napoleon, Hitler, and even Stalin, and remained stubbornly beautiful during the time of the summer solstice and the festival of the White Nights, when it never gets darker than twilight. In Moscow, it is dark at midnight, but Red Square is lit up by a bank of lights across from the Kremlin Wall. There is a misty rain on this night, but the guard at Lenin's tomb is changed, as it is 24 times each day as the clock strikes the hour. Exactly. Okay, this child has a uh, incomplete cleft of the palate. Surgery continues in St. Petersburg. The Americans remain concerned over Victoria and have learned there were doubts about her health and the ability to undergo surgery. An examination has shown no warning signals. We felt that um, she had some heart problems and the pediatricians have checked her out and said they don't hear anything. She may have had as, a, as an infant, but where are you going? Yeah. But um, if she did have a heart murmur as an infant, most likely it's closed. They also said that um, she has some liver problems, but she's not showing any outward signs of them of hepatitis. And that's what they're saying that she had. So we um, kind of pressed the issue a little bit with the physicians, and they said, yesterday, fine. So as soon as they said that, I rushed to the floor and got her. I said, I want to grab this moment. Before each child goes to surgery, some time is spent in a place the team calls play therapy. A lot of people in play therapy today. It's Victoria's turn. Victoria. Victoria. I think she wants to color more. Victoria. Hi. Sticker. You come with me? Yes. If you if you look, the upper jawbone is in three pieces. The lateral segment, the lateral segment, and the premaxilla should be a horseshoe arch, but hers is collapsed and the premaxilla is out. And the dental appliance will expand those segments so this can go back. It'll take at least two surgeries to repair Victoria's face. Dennis Michael DeMauro takes an impression of her mouth so he can make an appliance that will widen her upper jaw to make room for her front teeth. It is called an obturator, and Dr. DeMauro has found a lab where he can make them. In Russia, I have found they, have, they do a lot more obturators than we normally do in the United States because surgery does happen a bit later for them. And I've learned from my Russian counterparts quite a bit about making these. She has at least a 30 decibel hearing loss because the fluid provides a mechanical barrier to hearing. Now, I'm going to need suction next, please. Victoria is still in surgery. Ear, nose, and throat specialist Steve Early is placing tiny tubes to keep fluid drained from her inner ear. There we go. Good. Most of the kids who have cleft palate have fluid in their middle ear. Placing tubes to drain the fluid is common practice in America, but the Russians have never heard of it. Dr. Ellen Dutch did the ear surgery for the Moscow team. Most of them have mild hearing loss from the fluid. And putting in the tubes usually uh, returns their hearing to normal. Usually we get uh, a reaction to having those in right away. Uh, they come into the uh, recovery room very stimulated. The noise, it's like uh, they've been hearing everything underwater. And once the tubes are in and they've pulled a little bit of that fluid off, it's cleared and they hear things that they've never heard before. They hear sounds that they've never heard before. We can make a great deal of difference in bridging that gap and helping our colleagues here 
to jump the years of the closed society and very rapidly uh, improve their, uh, their currency of medical knowledge. Dr. Linda Rice gives a lecture on anesthesia to her Russian counterparts in St. Petersburg. So formulas are guidelines to use to plan, but if the patient seems to need something different, do what the patient needs. After that, oh, that. And the probe itself. The yes. problem yes. is that I have no problem. There were impromptu seminars almost constantly. Dentist Mike Demoro and Anna Solovieva compared notes in a cluttered supply room. Is a neazit. Uh, they have like a new medicine. In a hall at the Moscow Hospital, pediatricians Vinay Nadkarni and Galina Balakareva talk about antibiotics and their side effects. It, it, it's difficult for children to tolerate for long periods of time because it, it inflames the liver. How many milliliters total will you use? Uh, I use three and a half. Uh -huh. Three and a half milliliters. Uh -huh. Thank you. So not very much. And each little seminar, each surgical case has a double purpose, to change the life of one child and to pass on skills that will change the lives of hundreds of others. That child becomes the textbook. Uh, that is the chapter and verse of why they should be doing something, the judgment behind doing it, uh, much more than you can give in a written text. There you go. Victoria. Yeah. Oh, sweetie, she did great. Victoria is out of surgery and in recovery. We were all a little bit concerned about that for her. No, the nurses are really good. check on her periodically also on top of that. Thank you, Melinda. Do you have any doubt? No, I have no doubts. <laughs> but there are doubts. What's so next for Victoria? What future is there here for an orphan? Just an operator. He's a tough looking kid, and he probably is tough. He has to be. He's an orphan. And this is where he lives with 16 other orphans in a series of abandoned flats in St. Petersburg. These are Russia's street kids, a product of hard times. And such as it is, this is their haven. Igor Golubienkov is only 23 himself, but has taken on the responsibility of a large ad hoc family. Just a bathroom. Is there only one bathroom? Or? Only one. Yeah. Only one. It's a pity, but they, they cannot do it cause, because of the because of room because of lack of rooms, and they don't have hot water. Times are hard in Russia's cities, but there are signs of a new economy in the streets. At times, you have to run a gauntlet of unlicensed black market sales to get where you're going. A lot of the new Russian entrepreneurship is starting small. You see these little kiosks in alleyways and along the streets of both St. Petersburg and Moscow. But there is something else that's new in the Russian economy. Unemployment. Now everybody begins seeing what he needs and how to achieve, but basing on himself, not on the public, not on the society, not on the state, but on himself. Under the old system, Alexander Ivanov had it made, a job for life. Now he uses his car as a taxi to feed his family while he looks for a permanent job. You'd think he'd want the old system back. Not, not, not. I can tell you that I lived easily before. Yes. But uh, I don't like uh, uh, old system to be back here because market economy or new way of doing national economy will bring positive results. But unfortunately, uh, it will take us a lot of time because we are not prepared for these changes. Look how different she looks. <laughs> they weren't, Thanks be to God. Right? <laughs> they weren't able to do her palate then. Uh, this time or next yeah, time? Yeah, they said probably in six months to a year. Victoria is still in recovery. Dr. K's daughter, Julia, can't believe the change. Good morning. Good morning. 
and Who will do to be with you. Oh, my pleasure to be with you. Again. <laughs> yeah, again. Another, another good day. I told them yesterday we did the first combined American-Russian cleft palate together. Yes. Today we do the first combined cleft lip together. We'll do Mallard type lip repair. Uh, no, Tennyson and Limber Kabu. For you, yeah. I, I, I'm, my experience is Mallard. We do that today. The thing that makes the Mallard repair so good is that it's so simple. You don't have to think about it. It just works. You don't have to. And you can you can craft it as you go. Kiss. Kiss. Ah. Kiss. Heal. Keep. It. Simple. Simple uh, <laughs> stupid. <laughs> The surgical classrooms continue to a new beat in St. Petersburg. The Russians learn that Beatles music can break the tension of an operating room. It's uh, interesting and important for me to speak uh, with uh, uh, dentists and surgeons and see uh, how they work and uh, discuss uh, some problems of medicine, life, politics. Music and our mother. The St. Petersburg team repaired an ear and the scalp of a five-year-old girl who was severely injured in an earthquake in Armenia. Her parents brought champagne and flowers to show their gratitude. Thank you. The thing that you do, uh, that was for God, and um, it is impossible to forget it, and God knows that. This organization uh, helps us uh, to achieve our main goal here, to see uh, many smiles on the faces of our children. The Moscow team brought gifts for the children at Dr. Falova's hospital. It took a strong lady with a stern face to convert a former party headquarters into a hospital. Today there are tears of gratitude on that face. The Russians say they discovered something about Americans that may change the way they think about treating children. We've come across very interesting, kind, and uh, emotional people. <laughs> and we like very much their attention to children. Victoria is up and out in the halls again, no doubt confused about what's happened to her. And she is still alone, still an orphan. But members of the team from Operation Smile's Orlando chapter have contacted a couple in Florida who will come to Russia to adopt the little four-year-old who captured so many hearts. Sometimes when I start, I wonder, why am I, why, why am I doing this again? And then you start working with the children, with their parents, and you realize why you're here. Hi. Hi. They're just so cute. That's the thing that makes us special. This first trip I've ever been on, and it's driving me nuts because one day it's crazy and hectic and the next day it'll go ahead and tear your heart apart. She stood out from all the other kids and it wasn't because of her deformity, it was her personality. Once you saw Victoria and had a feeling of who she was, you never saw her face anymore. You saw her heart. When you see the children before the operations and the deformities, the ugliness, and then you watch the procedure, and then afterwards you see faces that have been changed forever. Doing. And those weren't the only faces that were changed forever. You see the families, the mothers and the fathers, that come in 
in total disbelief. 